Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet. With more than 2 million downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, and part of the Self-Help for Smart People podcast network. In this episode, we break down the complex and confusing world of body language and nonverbal communication we discover the easiest starting point for learning the basics you need to know to get started with reading and understanding body language. And we dig into specific tools and strategies you can start using right away to not only decode the body language of others, but also change your own body language to communicate what you want. We explore all of this and much more with our guest, Joe Navarro. Do you need more time, time for work, Time for thinking and reading, time for the people in your life, time to accomplish your goals. This was the number one problem our listeners outlined, and we created a new video guide that you can get completely for free when you sign up and join our email list. It's called How You Can Create Time for the Things That Really Matter in Life. You can get it completely for free when you sign up and join the email list at successpodcast.com. You're also gonna get exclusive content that's only available to our email subscribers. We recently pre-released an episode and an interview to our email subscribers a week before it went live to our broader audience. And that had tremendous implications because there was a limited offer in there with only 50 available spots that got eaten up by the people who were on the email list first. With that same interview, we also offered an exclusive opportunity for people on our email list to engage one-on-one for over an hour with one of our guests in a live exclusive interview just for email subscribers. There's some amazing stuff that's available only to email subscribers that's only going on if you subscribe and sign up to the email list. You can do that by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage. Or if you're driving around right now, if you're out and about and you're on the go, you don't have time, just text the word SMARTER to the number 44222. That's S-M-A-R-T-E-R to the number 44222. In our previous episode, We discussed how a few crazy ideas from quantum physics might just change your life. We looked at how some of the core principles from the hard sciences have huge implications for the way we live, love, and deal with a world of danger and uncertainty. Is it possible that the laws of physics hold lessons that could help us redefine our relationship with anxiety and suffering and open the door to possibility? We discussed this and much more with our guest, Mel Schwartz. If you want to learn how a few key principles from the hard sciences could radically transform your worldview, listen to that episode. Now for our interview with Joe. Today, we have another awesome guest on the show, Joe Navarro. Joe was approached to join the FBI while working as a police officer at the age of 23. He spent the next 25 years at the FBI working as both an agent and a supervisor in the areas of counterintelligence and counterterrorism. Since retiring in 2003, Joe has written several best-selling books on human behavior, most recently, The Dictionary of Body Language, a field guide to what every body is saying. His work is frequently featured on programs such as The Today Show, Fox News, Good Morning America, and much more. Joe, welcome to The Science of Success. Matt, it's a pleasure finally to be here. Well, we're super excited to have you on the show. As I was kind of telling you in the pre-show, I've been a fan of your work for a long time and have a copy of Read Them and Reap, which is one of your poker books sitting on my bookshelf. And so it's great to finally get you on here. Well, it's my pleasure. And I've been looking forward to this. So I'd love to obviously kind of the field of nonverbal communication, which you're, you're a, you know, a, one of the world's top experts in, is so vast and kind of immense. For somebody who wants to kind of approach that from a layman's perspective and maybe pick up a few sort of strategies or tools to make themselves more effective at understanding people and ultimately influencing them, where would you kind of recommend sort of starting and kind of breaking down this confusing maze of information? Well, that's a great question. And what I usually try to tell folks is this, nonverbals is everything that communicates that's not a word. So, I mean, everything from the kind of shoes you wear to the color of your clothing to how well you're groomed to the other stuff, the body language is all communicating. And so I think the first takeaway is 
we are always transmitting information about ourselves. We transmit information about ourselves by the cars we drive or how we keep our house, but also by our body language. And that's really what I'd like to talk about today is how we use that body language, both to interpret what people are thinking, desiring, fearing, and how we also use it to be more empathetic and establish better communications. I think that's a great definition. And it's really interesting that it kind of expands beyond, I think when you think about nonverbal communication, you you just sort of think of body language, right? And, and maybe a few related components. But it's really interesting that you kind of include all of these other things, you know, whether it's car, your clothes, what kind of pen that you use, all these different elements and they all really are communicating a tremendous amount of information if you're willing to sort of attune yourselves to be able to sort of absorb it. Oh, I mean, and the research now is so ample. You know, when I, as you know, from my books, when I started this in, in 1970s, there was so little research. I'll give you an example of some recent research in the nonverbal arena of, of influence where they took an individual and they asked him to go out and ask people for favors but he was just supposed to wear a sweater, a green sweater. And then, so they tallied how many people would help him. And then they took that same sweater, and I won't say which logo, but they just put a little half-inch logo of a famous clothier. And the difference was, without the logo, only about 13% of the people would help him. With the logo, about 52% of the people it would help them. And it's just fascinating the research that's being done now as to how sensitive we are to the smallest of things that says uh, this person can be trusted or is of higher status and so forth. So how do we start to kind of peel back the layers of that onion? Because I mean, and, and you know, as somebody who's been doing this show for years, and I've read several of your works and, and, you know, many other books about kind of body language and facial expressions and all this stuff, I still feel like a total novice when I get into this stuff. And, you know, I feel like I have a little bit of an ability to read behavior, especially coming from sort of the poker world. But it's such a confusing and kind of immense topic. How do we start to really kind of approach it in a way that we can really internalize some of those lessons? Really good question. And the easiest way is the same way that, you know, as babies learn to do this and, and parents learn to do this and that we are basically communicating at all times. We're either comfortable or uncomfortable. And this dynamic can change in a second. You know, as a baby, all of a sudden the baby starts squirming, starts crying, Obviously, there's an issue there. Maybe the baby is wet or needs to be padded or, or fed. We're no different. We can be sitting, you know, you're a young executive, you're sitting in a meeting and all of a sudden, you know, somebody says something and didn't go over too well. And you start seeing these displays of discomfort, things like, you know, shifting in the chair, lip biting, looking away, putting the chin down. Things that communicate, hey, you know what, you shouldn't have said that, that didn't go over too well. And uh, we're very good as a species at communicating both comfort and discomfort readily and in real time. And that's the beauty of nonverbals. And may I say this, Matt, that you know, nonverbals is the only means of communication that takes place at the speed of light. The minute somebody displays it, you are picking up those photons and you are immediately interpreting how they feel about you or, or how they're reacting to something. So I feel like we kind of hear this statistic thrown out all the time. But when you look at sort of what, and I know it's kind of a confusing topic, when you look at sort of what percentage, quote unquote, of communication is nonverbal, how do you sort of think about that question? Yeah, you know, throw the numbers out the window because nobody really knows because nonverbal communications take place in the moment. And that moment is in context is affected by many things. I mean, you can have a terrible day and you walk through the front door and, you know, you may be reflecting a day's worth of, you know, things that have adversely affected you. We know that in courtship behavior and dating, it can be as high as 100 percent. We know it can, you know, in a meeting, it could be less. What I try to teach is don't worry about what percentage it is. It's usually very high. Nobody, even if you're sitting in a chair doing nothing, 
you're still transmitting information. You can still transmit whether you're interested or you're just laying there totally disinterested. So what I try to teach is forget the numbers, just be aware that it's a high percentage, that we're always transmitting, that we're always being examined, that the people are assessing us the minute that we come into view. And the question is, what are they assessing? Are they assessing someone that is confident, somebody that's friendly, someone that appears to, let's just say, have their act together, or someone who is shy and maybe is, is insecure. What's interesting is when I do seminars, Matt, and I, and I say to people, I want you to stand up and I want you to look tough. Everybody, you know, sort of acts this out like they've seen on television, okay? And then you say, all right, I want you to look like you're studious, like, you know, you're a professor and they act these things out. And after we do about seven or eight of these, we say, now, what do you think people think of you when they see you day in and day out? Who do they see? And what's interesting is a lot of them haven't decided how do they want to be portrayed as a leader, as a follower, as, as someone that's confident or just someone that's happy following along. So can we sort of fake our our body language and our external cues to other people or will will people be able to sort of see through that? Well, I wouldn't say fake. You know, I hear that term a lot and I and I hate it because I remember when I first came into law enforcement, I'll tell you, I was scared. Uh, there were a lot of nights when I had to roll up on a scene and you know, I was there by myself, no backup for, you know, 15 20 minutes and and I was scared. But you have to present yourself as, you know, cool, calm and collected. And so I I go back to what Shakespeare said that, you know, life is theater. And what I tell people is it's not about faking. It's about what role do you want to portray and that we can portray those roles. Talk to anybody that's gone into the Marine Corps, become an officer, and they'll tell you they send them out into the classroom, outside the classroom, and they say, go find your voice, go find your posture, go find your presence so that you look like an officer, so that people are willing to follow you. And what else do we call that? We call that acting. (laughs) And so we have roles to portray. The question, of course, is how well do we do that? And, you know, exceptional people rise to the occasion and they do the kinds of things that are endearing of a leader. I'll give you an example, something that, you know, we were talking earlier, you and I, before the show about validation. Notice how the more senior you are in an organization, the broader your gestures are, but they should be smoother. And the minute we run into somebody who has very jittery gestures, and they're not very smooth, and they're very narrow, we tend not to respect that person as much as someone who has those broad, smooth gestures, which, by the way, from talking to military officers, this is what keeps the troops calm, because they get a sense of everything is okay from the nonverbals, not the verbals. I like that kind of perspective, and I think it's a much less sort of intimidating way to think about it is it's more like acting or sort of imagining the role that you want to fulfill or portray and then sort of living that out. And it's almost like a mental sort of shortcut or hack to be able to sort of change the way that you're thinking about your body language, the way you're sort of presenting yourself to other people. Exactly. You know, I'm what you call a high-end introvert. I'm a very private. I don't like big get-togethers. But I have to tell myself, all right, I'm going to do an event. There's going to be 300 people there. I need to break out of that. And it's in a way, you know, for some people, this comes very naturally. But for me, it's a performance that is part of me. This is part of me. It's not like it's fake because it comes from me. But I have to tell myself, this is a role I must fulfill now because these folks have come to see me. And, you know, I can't just go to the green room again. I need to be out there. And so it is in a way a hack of how do we overcome ourselves 
and yet reveal a part of ourselves because I do want to be a part of the group. I wish I was, you know, like some of the people that I know that just love to be in large groups, but that's just not going to happen. So I have to perform it. So I want to come back to this distinction that you made earlier, which I think is really, really important, kind of these two different buckets of lumping or sort of grouping behaviors into the sort of broad categories of comfort versus discomfort. I really like that as sort of a heuristic for thinking about it because there's so many ways you could interpret body language. And I feel like that's a great kind of starting point to say, okay, are the behaviors that I'm seeing sort of falling more into the categories of comfort or are they falling into the category of discomfort? And Matt, that's a great way to put it. Not just one behavior, but these three or four behaviors, where are they falling? I'll give you an example. You know, one of the things that we put under the comfort displays are when you see someone and they look very comfortable with themselves, they look confident. And so when we see them standing with shoulders broad, when we see them stepping away from the podium, when we see them with the open gestures, palms up, when we see them making direct eye contact, not just with one person, but with many people in in the audience, we say, okay, these are consistent with all the behaviors that one would expect to see with confidence. And this fits under comfort displays versus, you know, you're in sales, let's say, and you're talking to someone, they're asking you questions. But every time they ask you a question, what if they see you, you know, tucking your chin down, biting your lip or compressing your lip, doing something that we often hear and see where you all of a sudden have to inhale really quickly and then you shift your lips to the side, you go and then the lips shift or there's touching of the neck or ventilating where you're pulling on your jacket or or your shirt. Well, you know, they asked you a question. It was a simple question. Why are we seeing these displays of discomfort? Is it because you don't know the answer? Is it because this is a difficult area for you to answer? Or is it because there's some hidden issues there? Well, these may look like small little things, but to the average person, they may not be able to put a name on it, but they're sensing there's something odd here. And that's not the way we want to come across if we are in sales or in leadership. So you've given a couple kind of anecdotal examples of these, but I'd love to get into maybe some of the kind of the most obvious or the most predictive behaviors for somebody who's listening and wants to kind of practice these in real time. What are some of the biggest, for lack of a better term, sort of tells to look for around both comfort and discomfort? Yeah. So, you know, you and I were talking earlier, Matt, about uh, validation and, you know, go out and validate this. Notice that when the stock market drops, how often the photographs they take are of individuals, you know, pressing their fingers into their eyes, covering their eyes and, and so forth. Eye blocking behaviors are extremely accurate. You know, you're familiar with my work in, in the poker world. This is one of those areas where, you know, the flop comes out and as the community cards are unveiled, you see more and more of eye touching, eye covering. You know, the person is weak because here's something that I found fascinating in 1974 when I was studying these kids that were born blind. When they hear things they don't like, they cover their eyes. They don't cover their ears and they've never seen. So eye blocking is something that is part of our paleo circuits. It's very ancient with us as a species and we see it universally. The other one that I would tell you is lip compression is a very good indicator that something is wrong, that the person is either struggling with something or they're worried about something, as is jaw shifting, one that you often see in the boardroom, but you also see it in poker where the person is confronted with something and all of a sudden they begin to shift their jaw left and right. Jaw shifting basically says, I'm struggling here. I'm having difficulties. And it's also very accurate, as is the former I talked about, which is the neck touching. 
Now, men and women do it slightly different. Women tend to touch the base of the neck. It's called the suprasternal notch. There's a little dent there, and they tend to touch that and cover it with their fingertips. Men tend to do it more robustly by grabbing their necks, massaging their necks. Invariably, it means the same thing. I don't feel confident. I feel something is wrong. I'm concerned. I'm worried and so forth. Ventilating behaviors, you know, you ask somebody, hey, is that going to be done by Wednesday? And they start to pull on their shirt or they lift up their hair. Ventilating behaviors are saying, I'm having difficulty. There's something wrong here. And they're very authentic. And then, you know, when we come down to the hands, notice how expressive we are. When we're confident about something, our fingers tend to be spread very wide and our thumbs tend to pop up. The minute we lack confidence, boy, those thumbs just come crashing down. Our fingers tend to stand together and there's less hand dramatic movement. So these things, you know, which I point out in my latest book are very small by themselves, but when you add them up and you begin to see four, five, six, seven behaviors all at once, now you're building that confidence that something is seriously wrong here. Great examples. And, you know, I think there's a number of those that are really, really relevant. It's funny, you know, in poker, obviously you can see a lot of those. It's a great kind of learning laboratory What about sort of the other side of the coin, looking at sort of confident behaviors? What are some of those or what are some of the most kind of, you know, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of learning or developing the ability to kind of spot them? Yeah, I'll tell you, there is no such thing as low hanging fruit when it comes to positive because our brain, unfortunately, retains all negative things far longer than positive things. And there's a biological imperative for that. If we didn't retain negative things longer, we would probably have to learn not to touch the hot stove every day. Positive things don't stay with us for very long. So it's imperative that we do things right. Everything from doing the right handshake where our fingers are pointed down, they're not touching the inside of the wrist of another person, they're not crushing the hand, to when we stand in front of other people, You know, if you ask how many of you have had somebody stand too close to you when they're talking to you, everybody raises their hand in the same way they they tell you that they've had bad handshakes. And you figure, well, how do you screw that up? And so one of the things that you immediately need to assess for is how much space does each person need? And, And what I say is you lean in, you lean forward to shake hands, but then you take a small step back. That creates about two and a half to three and a half feet of space. And that's a good way to create that space that most people are actually more comfortable in. And then the other thing is don't stand directly in front of another person. If you want to increase the amount of time that people will listen to you, stand at an angle. It's actually easier to you know, it minimizes the amount of face time if you're directly in front of somebody versus if you're at a slight angle. And, you know, for everybody that's listening that, you know, we're all in the people business. And what are the things that we look for that are appealing? You know, people that are just, they appear friendly, they smile, they take the time to talk to you. And here's what's interesting. It doesn't matter what they say. It's a fact. It's the nonverbal of taking 15 seconds to stop and just chat with someone. And that is transmitting that I'm interested in in you as a human being. One of the more powerful things that we can do when we talk to people is be attentive to them. But how do we do that without coming across as we have an agenda? And one of the ways we can do that is just by tilting our head slightly to the side, by canting our head to the side, we are exposing our neck, the most vulnerable part of our body. And what we're doing by doing that is saying, I'm here listening to you. I may have an agenda, but right now I'm listening to you. You've got the floor. I'm attentive. And these are the things that are very powerful. And obviously, when things are very stressful, the best leaders slow everything down. 
They command the space. They command time. They command their own behaviors so that that has a pacifying effect on everybody else. And, you know, great leaders do that. The military is known to do that. This week's episode is brought to you by our partners at Brilliant. Brilliant is a math and science enrichment learning tool. You can learn concepts by solving fascinating, challenging problems. Brilliant explores probability, computer science, machine learning, the physics of everyday life, complex algebra, and much more. They do this with addictive, interactive experiences that are enjoyed by over 5 million students, professionals, and enthusiasts around the world. But one of the coolest things that I really also like about Brilliant is that they have these learning principles. And two of them in particular really kind of stick out to me as powerful and important principles. One of them is that learning is curiosity-driven. And if you look at some of the most prolific thinkers and learners in history, people like Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, they were incredibly curious individuals, just really, really curious. And it's so great to see that one of their learning principles is this principle of curiosity. Another one of Brilliant's learning principles that's absolutely critical is that learning needs to allow for failure. And if you look at Carol Dweck, if you look at the research behind mindset, this is one of the cornerstones of psychology research. You have to be able to fail to learn and improve. You have to be able to acknowledge your weaknesses. You have to be able to push yourself into a place where it's okay to make mistakes. These learning principles form the cornerstone of the foundation of Brilliant. It's such a great platform. I highly recommend checking it out. You can do that by going to brilliant.org slash science of success. I'm a huge fan of STEM learning, and that's why I'm so excited that Brilliant is sponsoring this episode. They've been a sponsor of the show for a long time, and there's a reason. They make learning math and science fun and engaging and exciting. You can get started today with Brilliant by going to brilliant.org slash science of success. That's brilliant.org slash science of success. If you've been enjoying our weekly Riddles in Mindset Monday, we're also collaborating with Brilliant to bring some awesome and exciting riddles to our Mindset Monday email list. And I think it's fascinating that a kind of negative impression that you might make with somebody will last much, much longer than a positive one. And so it's really important to kind of manage and make sure that you're not creating a negative impression with simple things like a handshake or personal space or, you know, your appearance, et cetera, when you're meeting people and trying to build relationships with them. Yeah, exactly. And so if you know that imperative that we have to strive to put more points up on that board of positive things, But remember, well, what are those positive things, that kind comment, that smile, something that you can do, even if you're on the phone and you don't have time to say hello to somebody, you flash your eyebrows when they come in, like as though you were saying, hey, how are you? You use your eyebrows to flash. Even though you're tied up talking to somebody, that communicates to the other person, oh, that's, you know, he or she is recognizing me. Remember, at at about three weeks of age, babies respond to eyebrow flash. And you can test this. Ask somebody if you can just look at their baby for a second. As you smile at the baby, flash your eyes and notice how they light up. Well, as it turns out, you know, I'm 65 and I still light up when somebody greets me that way. I think it's in our DNA to respond to that. And it's something that we can do every day that says to others, you know, you're important to me. And I don't know, you know, nobody knows, you know, is it because we're willing to burn blood sugars and do something that defies gravity by arching our eyebrows? Nobody's sure of this, but we know it works and we know that it's very positive. You know, it's funny. I I like the sort of phrase you said that it's in our DNA because even in psychology research kind of shows that people will respond to flattery even when they know that it's sort of insincere and obvious and kind of the same idea, right? Even if you're aware of a lot of these kind of nonverbal communication strategies or tools, they still work even despite the fact that, you know, people might be sort of consciously aware that, oh, they're, you know, doing these various things. Yeah, but, you know, that's one way to look at it, Matt. But the way I look at it is, you know, it's it's part of that myelation where we do things repeatedly. We do very short things repeatedly, and we build that into our DNA. 
and our neurocircuits actually become robust. And I don't know if it was because my grandmother did it and my mother did it and they made me do it, but it's something that if we don't do these things, we can teach ourselves to do it so that we become that person that greets others, that shows interest and so forth. And I think the more that we do it, the more genuine it becomes. I will caution you that most of us pick up when there's a fake smile. And, you know, I mean, we run into the the social smile all the time on the street. Somebody gives us that social smile. But we pick up, we're very sensitive to when people give us a false smile and there's false pretenses. And so I think it's important to differentiate that it's not about harboring bad feelings and then, you know, trying to fake it. It's really about can we bring ourselves to like each other and then, you know, just be have that pleasantness for each other and just make it part of your life and be genuine about it. Otherwise, we all know somebody that, you know, they're just odd. I remember working with a guy that never said good morning to anybody. I have never seen anybody so miserable in my life. And I and I think if he ever turned around and said good morning to me, I, I would have had to call the weather channel to see if hell had frozen over because this guy was just, I mean, his whole life, he just looked like he was constipated. And I have to think he was just miserable. And what's interesting about people like that, that think it's okay to be that way is that they create a field of toxicity around them and it affects a lot of people in their midst. And even kind of taking, you know, some of these nonverbal cues too far, I know in the past you've used the example of kind of the politician's handshake and how that can be kind of taking it too far. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of research that's been done and, and what kind of handshakes do we like? We don't like, you know, the politician's handshake where two hands cup you at, at the same time, the weak handshake, the jujitsu one where they try to be on top and all sorts of things. I think when we have social intelligence, when we have that emotional intelligence that Daniel Goldman was talking about, is we're very sensitive to others. What are their needs, wants, and desires, and fears? You know, and obviously, if you're shaking hands with a locker room full of athletes, you're going to have a stronger handshake. But the fact is that most people, you know, are not that way, and you're, you're going to have to respect what that handshake is. But Handshakes is the first time humans usually touch and, you know, all these chemicals are released, which can be either very positive or they can be very negative. Changing directions slightly, but kind of coming back to some of these cues that we can observe in other people. I know you've kind of famously said that the feet are the most honest part of the body. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Well, I'll tell you what, I came out with that in 2004 and people were just really resistant with that. They had never heard of this before. And of course, you know, at that point, I had sat through probably 13,000 interviews in my law enforcement career, somewhere around that. And so I had made these, these observations. And if you think about it, and it's something that you can immediately go out and test, nobody runs to the edge of a tall building. We inch over if it's very high. We don't run towards anybody that is a potential threat to us. If we see a dog that's snarling at us, we may look at it and keep our eye on it, but our feet immediately turn away. And you can go to a party, a reunion, and you see somebody that bullied you 30 years ago. And, you know, you might nod in recognition, but you, you'll find your feet turning away. Because your feet, in conjunction, obviously, with your brain, are responsible for your survival, they tend to be very, very accurate. And so when there's something we don't like, we immediately turn away. Ride an elevator by yourself, and you may find yourself leaning against the back of the elevator with your legs crossed. But boy, I tell you what, you get a bunch of guys that have been drinking and they get on the elevator and you will stop doing that. Your both feet will be planted on the ground because 
you know, in our brains, we have this exquisite system called the limbic system, and it is responsible for our survival. It doesn't care about social niceties. It just says, I will not allow you to be off balance when there are people around you that may be a threat to you. And so you immediately put both feet down. In the same way that, you know, the pupils of the eyes, when we see something that could potentially hurt us, the pupils tend to constrict so that we can see it with greater precision. These are things we don't have really a lot of control over. So, yeah, the feet, I mean, tell any child they're going to Disney tomorrow and watch their feet and they get happy feet. And, yeah, that was one that really sort of shook things up. But I I think even poker players now have validated this many, many times over where someone had the winning hand, the nuts, and they saw their legs, you know, jumping up and down. And you often see the shirt vibrating. So, yeah, definitely. So, you know, the thing that and you kind of pointed this out and you've given a number of examples of this, actually. But I think the thing that that really makes this come alive is when you start to try and just use some of these ideas at a cocktail party or at a meeting or whatever, and just spend a little bit of your kind of conscious energy and effort to kind of watch people and just see, okay, can I read something about their behavior and sort of take something away from it? And if, you know, at least for me, kind of approaching it like that, approaching it almost like a game, you start to sort of build these muscles subconsciously. And then eventually, and I know you're probably well beyond this point, you know, you can just see someone immediately know, okay, oh, wow, so their feet, their lips, you kind of aggregate all these factors together and start to get a real read on sort of their comfort level or their discomfort level, et cetera. Well, you have a very good point. When I started out, I, you know, I didn't know everything that I do now. I've slowly validated over time, and that's what I encourage people to do. You know, go through the book, the Dictionary of Body Language, pick a behavior and see how often you see it and validate what it really means. And the more you validate it, the less you have to think of it. You know, I get this question all the time. Do you really think about this? And I say, no. I mean, it runs, you know, like software. It just runs in the background. I don't have to break it down. But if I'm asked to, obviously I can. But, you know, when you have about 400 behaviors that I highlight, you're not going to look at all of them. But, you know, let's start with the eyes. You know, how often does someone who's stressed about something cover their eyes? How often is it that when we, you know, we've already made up our mind or we don't like something, we purse our lips? You know, you begin to validate these things and pretty soon you say, wow, you know, these are, you know, 12, 15 behaviors that I feel really confident about. Now let's see if I can go further and further and further. And so we all have beginning points But I think this is something that we can always grow. And, you know, and obviously you as an interviewer, a podcaster, you're listening to the voice. You're listening for stress. You're listening for comfort. You're listening to see if somebody is stuttering or their mouth is getting dry. You develop this ear for it and you don't think about it, but you know what's going on. And in the same way with body language, we can begin to validate a lot of these things and depending on our occupation. But, you know, at the same time, we need to stand in front of a mirror and be honest with ourselves and say, you know, do I look my best? Do I present my best? Do I look genuine? Do I look confident? What can I improve? What's my curbside appeal today? And can I change my curbside appeal to increase my likability? I've done that. I think we can all do that. I want to kind of look at another piece of this and and maybe sort of a little bit of a caveat for listeners. You tell a great story around uh, sort of a parking ticket and how negative cues can sometimes (laughs) be misleading. And poker is another great example, but I think the parking ticket story is a perfect sort of illustration of how it's not always sort of a perfect tell just because you see somebody being uncomfortable. Yeah, I think we have to be very careful with what we observe You know, people ask all the time about deception. Forget deception and body language because it's very difficult to detect. And the best example I can give was 
You know, here I was, the FBI's expert on body language, and I was asked to help out with an interview. And this poor woman, she she gets called into our office, and it has to do with financial fraud. And usually the first 20 minutes or so, we don't ask any hard questions. It's just a get-to-know-you sort of thing. And about 20 minutes into this conversation, I noticed that she's becoming more and more stressed. She's pulling on her hair a little bit, ventilating the back of her hair. Her lips have gone from being full to now they're just very thin and she's compressing her lips a lot. When she swallows, it's these really hard swallows. Her chin is kind of down and she's rubbing her hands together a lot. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, here are all the traditional tells that so many people have told me over the years are indicative of deception. I said, she's ready to confess. So I I said to her, ma'am, you look like you need to get something off your chest. And I'll never forget this because it's so humbling. She said, Mr. Navarro, thank God, because when I parked downstairs, I only had two quarters and the meter's running out. And I just... It was one of these things where it was, you know, a humble check. And I realized, wow, I saw the right behaviors. But what I didn't know was what was the cause. And this was a big eye opener to me that far too often we see behaviors, but we don't know what the cause is. And it's our job, your job, my job to when we see discomfort displays is to, when it is appropriate, to ask, is everything all right? You know, is something wrong and so forth? And had I done that early on, everything would have been fine. And as it turns out, as you know from the story, she wasn't even involved in this crime. Somebody had stolen her identity and used it to bill some insurance company. So we have a responsibility when we have this greater knowledge is you know, what are we doing with it? Yeah, I see the behaviors, but now what am I going to do with that? And my job is not to accuse, but to ask. And I have to tell you, when my daughter was growing up, I had to restrain myself because oftentimes she would come home from school and I could just tell that there was something wrong, that something had happened. And I think this is good for all of us. You have to restrain yourself and say, now is not the time, give her time, and eventually she will bring it up. And usually she did. She would say, oh, you're not going to believe what happened and so forth. Otherwise, we become that person that people may even want to avoid us because they see us as too intrusive in our observations. So we've kind of talked at length about the the sort of observation, sort of understanding side of the equation, talked a little bit about sort of influencing other people. I'd love to kind of dig a little bit more into sort of the influencing side and how we can use nonverbals to influence others. Good question. You know, I hinted at it earlier when I talked about our curbside appeal, but certainly with our interest where we actually take the time to spend even a few seconds with someone. I'm always amazed that I'll go to this place or that place and they say, yeah, you know, the boss, you know, he stopped by the other day and he asked me how my family was. And and they remember that six months later, these little things that we do. I think in a world that's become very much more relaxed, I think we still have to remember that we're very sensitive to hierarchy You know, I always tell the story when the conquistadores arrived in the new world, they saw the same behaviors here that they had seen in Queen Isabella's court. I think good manners, which manners in general are nonverbals, but particularly good manners are important. I think grooming is important. I think how we present, also how we move. For instance, we can all recount a time or a place where someone just, they just walk so slowly or they they walk like they just didn't care that we weren't important, that our movements are communicating something about how much we care, that when we are approached 
that we create an environment that says, you know, even though I'm busy, I'm willing to pay attention to you in a friendly sort of way, or at least I'm willing to say, look, I'm tied up right now, but I'll give you my full attention in about five minutes. But don't become that person that when you need an answer, you know, you, you fear going to see that person just because of their nonverbals. You know, people can tell, oh, he's he or she's in a bad mood. Listen, every day we have periods of time when when maybe we're not in in the best moods, but we have a responsibility when we see somebody that's coming towards us to say, okay, I need to put on that costume and I need to become that actor that receives people well, and that is all about nonverbals. One of the things that we can do, and I often have people in my class do this and say, all right, you're going to meet me at the door. You're going to ask me to sit down and you're going to sell me this pencil. But I want you to do all of that without saying a word. And it's interesting to see how people sometimes fumble, even the initial greeting and, you know, how to walk over, right? So maybe they point to the chair with their index finger, which I don't recommend. You should always point with a full hand with the palm open. And they tend to be very erratic and not smooth it out. This whole process, this theater is about making people comfortable, about showing that you're interested in them. And then about how you feel about this object. You're not selling the object. You're selling how you feel about the object. And it's always amazing to me how people get that wrong. They say, well, you know, how do I do that? And I say, how do you feel about this object? And that's when they have to think, how do I act about that? What if it was a puppy? Would you, would you transact that differently? And that's when they, they begin to get it. That's when they say, oh, look, take a look at my puppy. Isn't he cute, right? The smile, but without the words. And that's something that we can practice. And if I may, I, I've known a lot of actors over the years through my work. They all rehearse. They all rehearse this. So, Yeah, I think that's a great exercise. And, and it's funny just even sort of visualizing myself doing it, I'm already sort of picking up on the different ways that I would use a number of kind of nonverbal strategies to try and influence somebody. And it sort of gives you a little bit of insight into your own, you know, behaviors and the different kind of inflection points within that interaction where you can potentially change your behavior or sort of modify it to try and be more engaging and friendly, et cetera. Well, I mean, something so simple, Matt, as let's say you're selling me an eraser, would you grab it from above so that your fingers are blocking it as you hand it to me? Or would you grab it from the side so that you can see it so you're cupping it with both hands? Would you move it towards me softly so that as you're moving it, my eyes are naturally drawn to it because the orientation reflex kicks in, there's movement. And so now I'm tracking this thing. Would you hold it on your hands like it's something treasured or would you just dump it there in front of me? When we begin to break these little things down, you realize all these things affect us. And we can do very simple experiments where the people we're experimenting on really don't know what's going on, where we take one group and we say, here, take a look at this and let me know what you think. And then we take another group and we hand it to them in a very special way. And then we ask them, rate it. And invariably, how we handled that object you know, when we handle it properly, it's always rated higher. So kind of bringing this back to sort of concrete strategies that listeners can implement in their lives, what would be kind of one piece of homework or sort of an action item that you would give to somebody listening who wanted to start kind of testing out these ideas or start sort of building that, as you called it, sort of that software in your mind, that muscle of recognizing and understanding nonverbal cues? Yeah, absolutely. An easy one. Watch as people are reporting on the stock market on a good and a bad day and watch their nonverbals. 
turn the sound off on your television, watch a show and see if you can pick out what's going on just from the nonverbals. These are things that, you know, we do routinely, but, you know, focus on two or three behaviors. If you had to start today with three behaviors, I would say, look for the eyes, look for eye blocking, eye closure, look for lip compression, look for jaw shifting, neck touching, and notice when it happens, how it happens, what questions were asked, how they answer. And once you build that into your repertoire, you know, use the dictionary of nonverbals to go through it and say, well, what other behaviors are there? You know, things like a hard swallow, things such as, you know, somebody's asked a question and you find that they're, you know, all of a sudden their tongue is in their cheek. Why are they doing that? All these things are explained at length. But you have to start somewhere, and it's always a good place to start in the face. It's probably the most interesting. And for listeners who want to dig in, learn more, and find you and your work online, what's the best place for them to go? They can go to www.jnforensics.com, and that's my website. They can look at all the 13 books that I've published, my articles in Psychology Today and elsewhere. And, you know, they can email me at janforexnix.com and I'm happy to send them a free bibliography with, you know, over 300 articles or books on the subject. Well, Joe, this has been a fascinating conversation, a great exploration and, and a really awesome starting point into kind of the vast field of body language and nonverbal communication. So thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing all this wisdom. Matt, thank you. It's been a pleasure and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created the show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.